<laughs> okay, so if you cannot hear me, raise your hand. That's kind of a silly <laughs> thing to say. But <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Lauren, and thank you, everyone, for being here. This is a lot of fun. As Lauren mentioned, we've done this in the past here in the local Northwest area, so many of you have attended these kind of live tastings. This is actually the first large-scale sort of new origin tasting thing that I've done, so it should be, it should be fun and, and a little bit adventuresome. Um, as Lauren said, we're going to record the meeting, um, mainly because of the chat. We're going to have a lot of our interactions will be in the chat as you taste chocolate. Obviously, with this many people, we can't all stop and talk um, like we would in person, unfortunately. So I'll have you send your comments um, in the chat and also any questions. So Lauren will be our... Uh, sort of our chat hall monitor. And uh, if questions come up and I don't see them while I'm chatting away at you, then she'll, uh, she'll sort of save them to the end and help, uh, help us get stuff answered. So you put the chat in? And, jo and Rob will be having a poll in the middle of this. So he will get more um, structured feedback as well as your chats. So they'll be both involved. Yep, thank you. Um, so as Lauren mentioned, keep your, uh, keep your screens muted and we'll, we'll, uh, um, won't hear your dog barking or other kind of background noise. Um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen and, uh, talking a little bit about the chocolate that we're going to be tasting. So let me do that. Okay, so if you see a, um, a chocolate bar and, a, and, a, and a, some cocoa beans, just kind of wave at me. Let me know that this is coming through okay. All right, perfect. All right, so we have a number of chocolates to taste here today, and let me kind of explain a little bit about what we're doing. This is, this is the order we'll go in. We'll start with the Nicaraguan origin, the Opeo Nicaraguan. And then we'll, we'll cover those and then we'll go to the St. Martin, Peru. And we'll cover those. As we, as we taste, um, I'll explain a little bit along the way about the different roasting and conching techniques that are used and what's the difference between say a subtle conch and a medium conch and, and, and what that language means from, from a chocolate maker's perspective. <clears throat> and um, hopefully we'll just have some fun tasting together. So I want you to just dive right in. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna start and stop you on every one of these, but I'd like if you would to taste in this order. First, the light roast, subtle conch, Nicaraguan, then go to the light roast, long conch, and then do the same with the medium roasts and the dark roasts. So however you taste chocolate is fine, whether you stop and take notes, whether you have palate cleansers in between, um, just don't, chew it and swallow it. Um, you'll want to get the, the best tasting experience you can. And um, while you're doing that, while you're getting started. But Rob, can I just ask a question? So we're going to yeah. taste, I'm not clear on your instructions. So we're going to taste through Ohio first and then move over to San Martin or yes. yes. Okay. Do and so in the order that you've provided light to medium to dark roast. Yes. yes. Okay. And just a note on tasting, just so when Rob's, oh, hang on, I have to admit somebody else here. Uh, when Rob said you don't want to chew, one of the challenges is if you chew the cocoa butter, which melts just below your body temperature, it disperses the flavor in your mouth. And if you chew, it doesn't have a chance to do that. So you're not going to be able to provide Rob with the feedback you'd like because you're not going to really taste the chocolate. Thanks, Lauren. Okay, yes. So just to clarify, we'll do all the Opeo Nicaragua first, starting from light roast, go through both conches, then the medium roast, both conches, and the dark roast both conscious. And the reason I'm, I'm choosing this order is I want you to have a, um, an experience um, with some of the really subtle differences that can occur with conching time. And we'll talk a little bit more about conching um, here through the next few minutes. But in general, you're going to have the most, probably the most subtle differences as you look at different conch levels between the same roast. So you've probably, I, I can kind of make an analogy, you've probably all been to the optometrist and uh, when you're getting your eyes checked, um, 
the top the optometrist will say which is clearer a or b and you'll get you know two examples where he'll or he or she will flip the lens and you'll see and sometimes it's very obvious sometimes oh yeah that, the a is clearer sometimes at least for me i can't tell a difference they're absolutely the same and i just tell them i don't know they, they look the same conching is going to be very similar to that sometimes you may be able to tell a very distinctive difference between two chocolates that have been conched different differently. Other times, you may not notice a difference at all, and either is okay. Uh, and as we go forward here, we'll, we'll start a poll before too long. We'll talk a little bit about um, the conching, and, and you'll see what other people think. Well, the fun thing about polls is we'll do them in real time. You'll be able to see exactly what other people are, are tasting or what their preferences are along the way. And again, don't forget to um, jump on the chat and say what you think about any of these. So for example, you may be tasting the Opeo Nicaragua Light Roast Subtle Conch. And um, you may say, well, it uh, kind of tastes like a roasted hazelnut, or I don't really like this one, or eh, had better, you know, whatever. All comments are valid and all comments are, are welcome. The way that um, I'm gonna decide which of these, if any, actually go on to become real chocolate bars uh, will be to um, look at feedback like this and then decide, okay, well, this one looks good, this one not so good, um, and then use uh, a collection of palettes. Um, this is kind of how I make chocolate in general. I'll, uh, I'll find a cocoa bean that I like, I'll taste it, I'll um, I'll roast, I'll make a roast, do some different roast levels, uh, make some test batches of chocolate, and then realize um, that my palate is what it is. And I'll have several examples of different chocolate, maybe, maybe lighter or dark roasted. Um, I usually stick in the 70% range, um, uh, at first anyway, just to kind of have a, a constant base mark to, uh, to go back to. Uh, and then from there, um, uh, usually we'll end up, if, a, if the beans are really good, I'll end up going maybe with a 100% with version of it. Uh, maybe multiple roast levels or multiple conch levels, depending on if they're interesting and if, they're, if they sort of present a unique um, aspect of the, of the bean. So a little bit about these beans. Um, the uh, beans come from a company called Ingerman Fine Cacao. They're located in Nicaragua and uh, they have been around for some time. Um, if any of you go to chocolate events or when we had chocolate events, Ingerman would usually have a booth at trade shows and they would be promoting their beans and particularly promoting their fermentation process. They have some very nice beans coming out of Nicaragua and they'll ferment them differently and then offer those different fermentation levels to chocolate makers to, uh, as a variable to bring different flavors out of the chocolate. Just a little bit more about, about Ingerman. Um, there's about a thousand or so um, different, um, different farmers uh, working in the area. Um, there are 450 or so organic certified producers. The average farm, they're very small, two to three hectares, a few acres a piece for the farmers is usually pretty typical. And um, they try to work uh, they, to benefit the, uh, the local communities and the families of the, um, of the farmers, um, which is always good. Um, as a chocolate maker, a craft chocolate maker, um, I'm trying constantly to be careful about where I'm getting my beans. There's some questionable areas and some questionable practices in a lot of third world countries. So you've got to be cautious. Ingerman is one of the companies that is um, reputable and they're right there on site. And so I'm comfortable working with them. Okay, a little bit about what you're tasting as you're working your way through the Opeo um, and why I chose what I chose. So I will typically do different roast levels just to see what kinds of flavors can, can be pulled out of the beans. And then the conching um, is how long you heat the chocolate and mix it after it's actually ground up and, and, and in liquid chocolate form. 
Um, I chose a few different conch levels um, for, for a number of reasons. Let me kind of go through that with you because um, I usually get asked, well, what is subtle conch? What is medium conch? How long is it? What does that mean? So first of all, conching in general is heating up the chocolate and mixing it with the air and letting any volatiles boil off. So much like if you've ever made jams or jellies at home, you smell the fruit as it's boiling in the, in the, in the water bath, uh, you smell it coming off. That's um, similar, you're, you're boiling off certain chemicals in the chocolate to try to change or adjust the flavor. When I say no conch in general, I mean I've added no additional heat to the process. I haven't heated it up and mixed it at all beyond just grinding it and getting the particle size of the chocolate down so it's a smooth mouthfeel. A subtle conch in my equipment, now I gotta back up, there's a dozen different types of ways to conch chocolate with all kinds of different equipment. They all tend to be, um, they all have different characteristics to them. So when I say I conch for two hours or six hours or 40 hours or whatever, that really, the result of that depends on the equipment I use versus another chocolate maker who may have a different kind of conch and who may conch for the same amount of time and get much different results. So it's not completely consistent across the, across the, the realm of chocolate makers. So I say that just so when I describe to you what these conch levels mean, you've got kind of an idea of where I'm coming from. So no conch is no additional heat. A subtle conch, I usually heat the chocolate up and I will um, mix it and aerate it for a very short amount of time, literally an hour, maybe an hour and a half, just to start to change the flavor. Medium conch is usually double uh, what a subtle conch is, so two, three hours. And a long conch is going to be anywhere from eight to 12 hours, at least in my equipment again. Um, you will hear or sometimes see chocolate labeled as conched for 72 hours or conched for four days or something like that. That's very valid and it probably is the type of conch they're using that um, is a slower process. Um, some conches will do the same thing mine will do um, in four hours in 30 minutes. It just depends on the type of equipment and, and what you're doing. The, there's a danger of doing it too fast. You can get rid of some nice flavors along with any of the off notes that you're trying to get rid of uh, by the by the conching process. So that's a bit about conching. Um, roasting is very similar. Most I people- ask, Tiff, What kind of conch do you use? Uh, let me come back okay. to that. Um, I'm gonna save questions for a little bit later. Okay. Um, Sorry, I'm so busy tasting. I'm, I'm not yeah, that, that's fine. <laughs> the rear. I, I'll try to answer most questions that, usually, that I usually get sort of as I talk through this, uh, um, but any questions that we miss, um, we'll go back through the chat and, and I'll pick okay. those up. When we get to the end of conching, we'll, we'll ask them. Okay. Roasting, more people are familiar with roasting in general um, because uh, coffee is roasted. Roasting is something that is, is generally more people are more familiar with. Um, usually I will do two or three different roasts of a particular cacao origin. Um, there's usually some interesting flavor notes you can get with a lighter roast versus a darker roast. Um, sometimes three roast levels, a medium roast as well can bring out some interesting notes. Um, that's part of why we're here is for you to give your feedback and tell me, yeah, the medium roast was nice, the dark roast was too dark, or it was great, the light roast was too acidic or too vinegary or too sour. Um, there's anything, any, anything you can tell me about what your palate is, is sensing would be, would be very helpful. Okay. So before we answer poll, any, any of the, the, these questions coming in on the chat, um, I'm going to launch a poll here. Now, let's see if this is going to work. Um, wave or raise your hand if you see the poll on your screen. Excellent. Okay, a few of you are, are waving. So how this works, if you haven't done a poll in Zoom before, is you have uh, however much time we want to take to, to answer the poll questions and when you're done answering the poll questions, then um, I will end the poll. Now, I don't necessarily see all the answers coming in until after we're done. So I'm going to kind of have to take a guess as to when when to end the poll, but I'll, uh, I'll have you wave at me. 
That says how many people voted. Oh yeah, attendees are now viewing questions. Um, zero percent voted. So that's fine. Oh, here we there go. There they go. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Vote, vote. <laughs> this is our first time doing a poll on yeah. Zoom too. Usually we have smaller groups and it's um, uh, we just talk back and forth. But since we're we're this size, we'll just uh, go through these. Um, let's see, Sarah. You're saying you saw it for a second and it left. Can you? I can't see you right now, Sarah. Can you see it again or is it gone? And did you have a chance to answer the questions? It's gone. Um, <coughs> is that a, has anybody else had that experience? Or can you still see it? You can still see it. Um, if you have multiple windows open on your computer and you click on another window, sometimes the poll disappears behind your active window. Um, I've had that happen. See if that possibly is a. Is Debbie happening. also can't see it. Yeah, but try that, Debbie and Sarah, and let's see if that fixes the problem. And again, I can't see everybody. So um, you can try doing hold your alt key down and hit the tab key. And then the, you'll tab through every thing and it should get you. So Debbie and Sarah, can you chat and tell us, are you okay to see it now? Or are you still having trouble? Okay, Sarah found it in a second Zoom window. How about you, Debbie? Still having trouble. Um, so let's see, try, should Rob, should try clicking on Zoom. Oops. So um, Debbie, if you can, maybe try clicking on the Zoom icon on your computer and see if it comes back up. Rob, why don't you go ahead and talk and um, I, or keep going. I, I don't, I'm, I, I'm, it looks like Maybe Debbie will be able to get on, but let's see. Okay. If for some reason any of you can't see the, the poll um, or disappeared on you, I'm just asking you which you prefer of, of the different conch levels uh, of each of the light, medium, and dark. Um, worst case, just put it in, put your thoughts in the, in the chat and uh, we'll capture that after the meeting. Hey, uh, Rob, there's a question. How different are people's palettes? I'm wondering if I could start answering that and you and I could have a quick chat on it. I, I feel yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. your palette is a very personal thing. It has to do with your own taste memory. And in chocolate, there is no standardized tasting. You know, unlike coffee, especially coffee, there's Q graders, there's a there's one flavor wheel, there's standardization, people get certified, you know, same with sommeliers and wine. That is not currently true in chocolate, although there is an international group working towards a standard. And so there's really no wrong answers. <laughs> and the reason those standards are really important is for this very reason, because then you train your palate so you can have the same vocabulary. So you can actually have a conversation about what you're tasting and have that same vocabulary and be able to say, well, you know, this is the, I'm getting raspberry and know that everybody else is, who has been trained on that vocabulary and that palate is having the same conversation about what they mean by raspberry. But right now that doesn't exist in chocolate. And so people's palates are very different. It goes back to your childhood, how you've grown up, you know, what you've eaten over your lifetime. So um, so it is gonna be a very personal thing. I don't know, Rob, do you have anything to say about that? I think you really hit it. It is personal. Um, if you, the, the thing you wanna be careful of if you're new to chocolate tasting is don't let anyone tell you what you should be tasting. You'll often see tasting notes on the back of chocolate bars, especially craft chocolate bars, where a, a chocolate maker may, may try to guide you down a path um, with good intentions, but that may not be exactly what you taste. Uh, so don't feel bad or, you know, it's not the emperor's new clothes kind of a concept where if everyone says I should be tasting floral notes, I guess I do. No, it's whatever you taste it's, and, that's, and that's very valid. Well, and the thing about when they print the tasting notes on a, a label, you know, these labels are probably printed in batches of thousands, right? Mm -hmm. But the chocolate maker may do many different batches of chocolate and put them in that same packaging and each batch may taste different. So yeah, it may have tasted like those notes the first batch they did when they printed the label, but then they keep using that label and the next batch may not. So I take those with a grain of salt. Sometimes I agree with them, sometimes I don't, you know, they're just a suggestion. Yes. That's true of all, uh, mine included. I will sometimes put tasting notes on the back of my bars. And it is just what my palate tasted and a, a few others tasted generally about the chocolate. But 
it's and it will change. I guarantee it will change as the harvest years uh, of the beans change because of the terroir of the beans, the rainy season, the soil conditions, the temperatures are all going to change how the chocolate tastes because of how the beans um, are are formed. And Rob, when do you want to answer the equipment questions? Do you want to say? Go that? ahead. Go ahead, and if you. So would. somebody had asked what kind of conch you use, which I know is an interesting answer. So maybe. Go ahead and answer that. <laughs> sure. So there are essentially about four different general concepts or kinds of conches. Um, <clears throat> mine is um, sort of analogous to a lint style of conch, which basically sort of sloshes the chocolate around while it heats it up. It's a. It's a different basically it's it's a large it's a large vat that's that sloshes the chocolate around and um, um, heats it up with convection heating um, it's my own and I made it myself I'm an engineer and and um, so I made a lot of my own equipment um, just to get started in the chocolate making world and uh, I still use a lot of it it's it's just fun I I find that to be part of the fun of chocolate making we have someone asking for a photo. I, I know you're you kind of hold those close to the vest. Do you have one you would could share? Or if not, I have one of a lint one somewhere that I'm looking for that I could share in a bit so they get at least get a sense. Yeah, after after we finish the slide presentation, um, if you don't have it, I know I have it in my my conching presentation. Okay. I'll I'll look for it and see if I can pull something up. Yep. Uh, I mentioned there's several kinds of, of conches. There's the lint style, which is the old original style that sort of just heats the chocolate and, and, and sloshes it around in a big tub. Um, there's a, a, a larger type of a, of a tub that um, has scrapers that uh, roll the chocolate around um, with big blades that spin around inside. Um, all of these have names that were named after the original person who founded um, who came up with the idea and usually patented it. Um, there's a... Um, Somebody asked, do they call it a longitudinal conch? That's a different type of conch um, that actually has the blades that, that slosh the chocolate around are on a, on a long horizontal axis and it, and it throws the chocolate around and around. Um, then there's a universal, which is a combination of a grinder refiner and conch, um, which has a whole bunch of blades on the inside of a big tub or a big, um, a big tube, I guess. Uh, and it, um, and it um, scrapes the chocolate um, between two metal plates as these plates go around and scrape <laughs> the inside of the tub and heats it at the same time. Um, we got pictures of all these. If we have time at the end, I'll definitely pull those up. Any other questions, Lauren? Um, I was just pulling up my picture of what I think is a longitudinal conch, but let me um, let me see. Uh, I think we're. Oh, what temperatures do the different roasting levels and conching levels reach? Ah, uh, yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's very specific to chocolate makers to the equipment. So chocolate uh, is roasted. I'll start with roasting. Chocolate is roasted at a lower temperature than coffee. Coffee is typically in the 400, even over 500 degrees, depending on the stage. Um, chocolate is more in the high 200 to mid 300 degree range. So um, I mean, some chocolate makers will roast at 350. Some will roast at 275. It's in that range. Um, I tend to like to roast longer at a lower temperature to get more even temperature distribution through the beans. Um, it's all very personal preference for the chocolate maker and based on the equipment they use. Um, conching is much lower temperature. Um, it's usually not over 200 degrees Fahrenheit. These are all Fahrenheit. The, um, uh, there are conches that will max out at 150 or 160 degrees. Um, there are others that'll go a little bit higher. Um, if you're doing milk chocolate, you have to go lower or you'll you'll end up caramelizing um, the, the sugars in the milk and change the flavor of the chocolate. So there's a number of variables there, but typically under 200 degrees, more like 150 to 60 for conching and in the high 200 to mid 300s for roasting. It's pretty, a pretty general range that's consistent. That's all we have for now. All right. Cool. We have, whoops. Oh, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, sorry. 
Yeah. I, I hit the hit my mouse button. If you saw my screen go crazy, that's <laughs> fine. Okay, so it looks like <clears throat> we've got 22 of 32 people have voted. We have some people out there who are still slacking. I mean, still tasting, <laughs> or or they've gone. Uh, they they've left and they're they're uh, doing something else. 71 percent. Uh, and I love that some of you didn't hesitate to put I don't like either because that's the kind of feedback that we need. And that picture that Lauren showed at the beginning, um, the funny story about that, because that was, oh gosh. That was Ghana, Ghana and, and Sierra Nevada, and, Columbia. And Columbia. We don't have a Columbia bar because <laughs> it just, it, it, everybody's opinion was so over, you know, all over and, um, really kind of, it was like, yeah, none of us really liked that one very much. And what we wound up doing with it, it didn't go to waste. We wound up selling it to a local ice cream maker and uh, in Bellingham, and he made the most amazing Colombian chocolate ice cream out of it. So um, it, it, this feedback is really super important and we really appreciate the honesty. And somebody's asking if there's a way to go back to the poll to change their answers. This is the first time I think either of us has done polling. I don't see any way to do that unless Rob, you know of something. Um, I read through the polling, um, the Zoom polling training. And if I stop the poll and start over, everything goes away. And once you hit submit, it goes away. So it's not that flexible apparently. So unfortunately <laughs> not. Um, if uh, we'll, we'll do it sort so of the maybe simple way. Trish, if you have different feedback, maybe go ahead and just put it in chat and we'll, yeah. at, we'll at least that way we're capturing all of those notes. That would be really helpful. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Just put it in chat. And we're see. let's see, somebody is asking, let me just see. Evelyn would like to know, are there other origins aside from Columbia that were difficult to work with or less popular? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, the history is long <laughs> and sorted. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Let's start at the beginning. I started in 2003. I got my first bag of cocoa. It was a um, Venezuelan Caranero Superior. I didn't know what to do with it, so I just started playing. And it, it turns out it was a wonderful origin and just, you really, you couldn't mess it up. It was just, it just made wonderful, really good chocolate. And I thought, huh, well, this is easy. So then I bought my next bag of, of, of beans, actually about two bags uh, from Jamaica. And uh, I tried it and um, um, I got, uh, I did early tasting, I got early tasting feedback from, um, some of you know Chloe, she's a uh, professional chocolate um, taster. Somalia, Somalia. Chocolate Somalia. <laughs> um, I, I introduced myself to her around 2005 and said, hi, I'm a new chocolate maker, will you taste my chocolate? <laughs> and she said, yes. So I ended up shipping a lot of packages to France where she was living at the time. And uh, her feedback on the Jamaican was, this tastes like a wet cigar. It tastes <laughs> like grass. It tastes like any, and she had a number of descriptive um, um, adjectives that were not as complimentary as I would have hoped, but she's French, so it sounded nice. The, <laughs> the interesting thing was, um, I, as an engineer, I don't get offended. So that kind of feedback is awesome. I love hearing that there's defects or problems. Well, it turns out, funny story, I'll go back in the history a bit. At this point, I was making chocolate with a little tabletop grinder and some little tabletop roaster and a homemade winnower. I was making it chocolate on a workbench in my garage. Literally. And, literally. And it was a garage at that time. It was not a kitchen. It was a garage, but it was just, you know, it was for fun. Um, mainly because the little grinder was noisy and we didn't want it in our house running for three days, you know, all, over, all night. And uh, turns out the chocolate was picking up notes from my lawnmower after I'd cut the grass. After our son had just <laughs> cut the grass, yes. And Chloe had picked up on that. So it was a real learning experience for me that, wow, this stuff is, is not as easy as that first um, Caranero Venezuelan um, chocolate led me to believe. So- um, Papua New Guinea was rough to Papua work with. Papua New Guinea was rough to work with, yes very um, fruity, uh, some of the, some of the, very inconsistent, some of the shipments were over fermented, 
and over fermented Papua New Guinea kind of tastes like a wet band-aid smells. It's just not good Nasty. at all. It's, it has a chemical smell, chemical taste, just horrible. Um, so that was really rough to work with. The Colombian we mentioned, just couldn't get the right mix out of there. Um, sitting on my shelf right now out in our, in our chocolate shop, I probably have three dozen different origins of beans that are sent in sample size, usually a couple of pounds. They'll send a kilo bag and say, hey, try my, try my beans. Um, boy, um, some of them are, are not bad. They're just not necessarily good. They're not exceptional. And so I end up just kind of passing on them because um, you know, you have limited time and resources and it takes a lot of money to start up a new line, even for a small maker like me. So I try to go with things that are a bit unique. Um, so those are, those have been some challenge. Oh, the one, the one bean that was very challenging that we did go to production with was Peru Marignan. Huh. Oh my gosh. That, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we got some 2013 Harvest Marinon. It was amazing. Phenomenal. That was the one we did in the kitchen back in the old store. You did a whole thing and we loved that bar. We were doing oh. this experience. We were tasting through all your, or and it was just this amazing cacao. But then. <laughs> but, but then, it uh, turns out I got some of the last samples of the 2013 Harvest. As a chocolate maker, I got excited and overwhelmed with the possibilities and decided just, I'm just going to go buy a bunch of, of this stuff. Ended up being the 2014 harvest. And they didn't tell us it was the 2014 harvest either. Yeah. So, yeah, so anyway, uh, about a half a ton of beans show up and um, we, we, um, you know, it's about six sacks of beans. So we started um, unbagging them and uh, made our first batch and it just something was not right. Well, they had a very wet season that year, rainy season. They couldn't ferment at the right temperature. And so the tannins were horrible. It was like eating grape skins trying to, trying to eat this chocolate. And it was awful. Um, we couldn't figure out what in the world to do with it. Uh, Amy was, was on a trip visiting. Yeah, fun story. Visiting some uh, chocolate maker friends in Park City, Utah. Mm -hmm. Um, ritual, ritual. Uh, Robbie and Anna, and uh, she was in their shop and Robbie came out. And he came said, running out, literally. Taste this, taste this. He had the same 2014 harvest beans and he wanted to know if we could get rid of this flavor and uh, shook your head and yeah, said, Yeah, I just nope. said, nope. <laughs> <laughs> it's there. So a lot of those beans um, are gone. They were in the garden, they're in the recycling <laughs> bin. So almost a half a ton of beans went away. <laughs> um, so we've had a couple other comments and questions. Somebody said, I, or Evelyn saying, I've heard that some origins can be inherently trickier. And I know you've talked about that, but I, you had once made a comment to me about Chihuahua that I thought was really interesting about how with, you, know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you said, you know, with most origins, when you roast it higher, it just tastes like you roasted it more. But with Chihuahua, when you change the roast and go higher, it just changes the flavor completely. Is that true? It, it is, yeah. And in fact, oh, you have another, I'm, I'll just admit him. That's a friend of ours, Noah, from uh, Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. <laughs> who just joined. Um, yes, it is. And in fact, we haven't had good Chihuahua for a number of years in the U.S. It's been hard to get. Um, just a few weeks ago, I got a nice sample. I roasted it. Um, I just pulled it out of the conch last night. And it is phenomenal. So we have Chihuahua again in the U.S. All right. It is three times the cost of any other beans. So it's a very expensive chocolate to work with. So you really don't want to mess it up. <laughs> um, but this stuff is really, really good. And so I'm excited about perhaps bringing it back. Yeah. So we're working um, on that. Well, awesome. Thank you that. so much. That was a great answer. Um, I didn't hear about all of it. And um, Debbie is asking, you mentioned half a ton. Debbie's asking how large are the bags of beans you usually use or purchase? Sure, they're pretty consistent, anywhere between 50 and 70 kilos. So 120 to 150 pounds per bag. They're jute sacks, they're, you know, like you picture coffee comes in big uh, tan jute sacks. Um, the exception is this Nicaraguan beans that you're tasting came in 25 kilo smaller jute sacks. And they had um, what are called grain pro bags inside. So basically really heavy duty um, um, 
Ziploc bags inside to keep the beans from getting contaminated with um, things that contaminate beans, which there's a lot of things that can mess your beans up. Um, so those are really good quality when they showed up, the Nicaraguan. Um, but so 25 kilo bags or 50 pounds ish, uh, 55 pounds is on the low end and then all the way up to 150 pounds. So they're a little bit cumbersome to move around. Um, Diane's asking, and I, this is kind of a big question, so I, maybe you can just nod to it. How much variation is there within a country compared to differences between countries? Um, seven. <laughs> 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 so a bit, a, a, a huge variation, um, even but from farm to farm or, or co-op to co-op. Um, for example, if you look at a country like Venezuela, there are so many microclimates in Venezuela that you can have completely different tasting beans um, in a valley that's five miles away from, you know, the next valley of beans that you're getting, the next region you're getting beans from. Um, it has to do with the climate mostly uh, and whatever variety of bean they've planted, of course. Um, it's like we're in Washington State here and we have I don't know how many varieties of apples. There's a bazillion of them. Some of them are those big red delicious apples that you get at the grocery store that are not delicious, but they are very red. Um, <laughs> others are these little heritage um, apples you get at local stands or local growers, and some of them can be just wonderful. Beans are the same way. There's varieties, all kinds of varieties of beans, and depending on where they're grown and how they're, they're they can be so different. So when you find something like a, a Opeo, Nicaraguan bean from a company that knows how to bring them in consistently, like Ingerman, then if you like it, then that ends up being a good thing. Oh, by the way, funny thing about the name Opeo, it sounds exotic. Um, Peo was one of the original farmers that they worked with, and the O, it means it's organic. So they named, their name is kind of simple, but it just means Opeo, organic beans and our, our buddy Opeo, <laughs> our buddy Peo was one of the first guys that we worked with to get him. <laughs> so Rob, you just kind of mentioned Ingeman, and so do they do a pretty good job of consistent like fermentation recipes and getting you similar flavor each time, or is is that part of the, or or is it variable like the others? So far, it's been good. I haven't worked with them very long, but so far it's good. I only um, have a couple hundred kilos, um, five hundred pounds or so of of this bean, um, so it's my first experience with them. Um, but I've known them for a number of years and I know people, other chocolate makers who work with them and have had good experiences with them. So okay. high hopes. Um, Luis is asking if these are your first beans from Nicaragua. The first beans from Nicaragua that I bought in any volume, I've had four or five different Nicaraguan um, samples come in before. None of them really were, they weren't anything I wanted to work with, but these are the first Nicaraguans that I'm excited about. Okay, we do have a number of other questions. How do you feel about answering those versus moving on and getting to them? I'm, I mean, they're great questions. It would be fun to have that discussion, but I also want to make sure we get you all your feedback. Yeah, let's let's have you um, finish up your polling. Um, we've had the poll open for 24 minutes. There's a little timer ticking off here. I don't know if you see that or not, but it's on our end. Um, it shows that there are 31 of 32 of you have voted. So if there's anybody who wants to, there's, I know there's 35 people out there, but if anybody hasn't voted and you want to vote, get that in within the next less under a minute, and then I'll close the poll and we'll share that, those results with everybody. It'll be kind of fun for you to see what others are thinking. Okay, so in the meantime, um, Judy wants to know how costly was that shipment of useless beans, the ones from <laughs> if you're willing to share. We got to take it off on our taxes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I can't even remember. Um, I don't remember, a few thousand dollars. It was it a few was, thousand dollars. Um, well, they were, they were $5 a kilo um, and 500 kilos. Three so five, five, yeah. twenty five hundred dollars yeah. $2,500. $2,500. Um, Michelle is asking, sometimes, she says, sometimes a bar has an alcohol taste, and she's saying not fresco, of course. What causes that? Um, an alcohol taste. I've, I've had different experiences with that, and I'm not sure what you mean, but I'll answer, answer I'll give you two answers based on what I've seen. Um, I've had chocolate that has kind of a hops kind of a flavor, um, like, um, I don't drink beer, but like, um, people who, who 
describe beer, it, it reminds me of, of hops. That's more of a grainy kind of a sensation. I've also had chocolate that has a, has a um, as it melts in your mouth, you get this sort of feeling in the back of your throat, like, um, like, like an alcoholic beverage sort of experience. Um, I don't, some of that is the acidity of the beans. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I, and I'm not sure if you're, if you're experiencing sort of the acidity, which gives you kind of an aromatic sensation in the back of your throat as it melts, or if, if it's more of the grainy hops kind of a, kind of a flavor. If, if you make chocolate and then immediately taste it versus letting it sit for like three weeks, could that affect that taste or no? It will affect the taste in general. Yeah. Right. Right. But chocolate. I mean, will it have more of that whiny taste or not necessarily? Not necessarily. Um, let me come back to that, but I'm going to end the poll so we can kind of move things along here. And Debbie is asking about the cacao workers for Opio. Are they fairly paid? Well, I don't actually know them personally. Everything that Ingerman says and reports in their in their reports shows that they're paid above the. Um, there's a standard level. Um, like West African level, and then everyone sort of compares themselves to that level. And everyone that I work with is much higher than that level, Ingerman included. Um, I'm not sure what fairly paid is, be, to be honest with you. And I don't mean that flippantly. It's just there's so many ways to measure that and so many standards of living around the world that um, I know they're paid well enough to um, to work with the co-op and to and to you know want to be consistent year over year and sell their beans to the, in the same in the same group and they take extra time with their fermentation processes so they're compensated for that time as opposed to just whipping out beans and selling them to the lowest bidder so and then we oh, we have one other question which mm -hmm. I, I think it's Kay Judson is asking regarding locations wine AVAs are mapped and officially filed is that done for cacao no no <laughs> no there's nothing standardized in cacao for the most, or at least fine cacao. Okay, let me share my share the results. See if you can see this. Uh, is everyone seeing the poll results on their screen? All right. So this is what you've all answered. So for the Opeo, light roast um, between the subtle conch and the long conch, um, the long conch was much preferred. And a few of you didn't like it, and that's good to know. Thank you. Between the Opeo medium roast and the subtle conch and the medium conch, the medium conch uh, was preferred about uh, 75%, 74% to 26%. The dark roast, um, long conch again, it looks like a trend here. The longer conches are, are being preferred. And if you, if you have a a reason why on any of these, do you prefer the longer conch if you did or the shorter conch, um, make sure you just send a quick chat note and feel free to abbreviate. You, you may not want to spell out Opeo, subtle conch, light roast, just abbreviate um, SCLC or something, subtle conch, long roast, whatever uh, subtle conch, long roast, that made no <laughs> sense at all. Did it? That made zero sense. Anyway. <laughs> Um, shorthand is fine in the in the chats if you just want to send a quick note, we can decipher it. Um, dark roast, long conch again, and then select up to three Opeo recipes you prefer over the others. So this is kind of the, you know, which three do you like better than the others? Um, we had the favorite in the group was the dark roast medium conch. Um, we had the medium roast medium conch and the dark roast long conch were sort of equal along as well as the light roast long conch. <clears throat> Interesting. Everybody likes the long conch. Yes, they do. There's one piece of paper on Hold here. on just a second. Let me get my screen. Oops. So again. All right. Five. Sorry for the delay. Okay, I'm going to, unless there's any polling discussion or questions, I'm gonna stop sharing the poll. All right. Oh. Um, hey, Valentina, you may need to clarify. Valentina's asking 
how much do you want the flavors to be better suited for larger audiences? Can you clarify what you mean by that, Valentina? I captured it. Okay. Okay, Lauren, um, I'm gonna go on if you're okay. Uh, yeah, Valentina, okay. Valentina is gonna, I guess, give us a text about, or a chat and what, what she means. Great, and I think I'm seeing, I'm sort of multitasking. I think I'm seeing some other questions in the chat window, but you just stop me and ask me when, when you see them pop up, Lauren. Oh, Diane wants to know what was the chocolate maker favorite? <laughs> medium roast, medium conch. That's, that's Amy's favorite. Um, I kind of prefer the light roast longer conch, but that's just um, my personal preference is more of the acidic fruity flavors, personally, but um, that's where we are. Now, if I were baking with this or if I were making it with something, making a drinking chocolate, I would definitely go with the dark the roast. roast. Just personal preference again. You um, know, Valentina, why don't you turn on your microphone and ask that question? Um, and I'm not sure what you're asking. Oh, hi, guys. Hi. So um, uh, I, I don't want to, like Ryan and I have been trying to, because we both understand what we want to try to tell you, and we just don't want to call chocolate crowd pleaser because you're craft chocolate. So you're not, you're not doing a Mars bar here. But um, um, sometimes uh, some chocolates are very easy for people that know a little bit more about taste, tasting profiles and have tried more and more chocolates. Um, uh, we're just curious because, if, for example, uh, we found the, the first two to be um, really interesting, but to us, probably it, it works for us, but it might be, but they might be a little too unbalanced and bitter for people that don't, um, don't do craft chocolate on a regular basis. So, uh, uh, and we actually like more uh, the last two, so the longer conch, uh, conch ones, because we found them to be more balanced. Um, so our question is like, how much you guys put into like, well, we want a bar that reaches a larger audiences as opposed to people like us, for example, that I see a lot of like familiar faces like um, um, here in the chat and we have been exposed to this a little longer than other people. So uh, does it clarify a little bit, Lauren, or it's still a little? Yeah, no, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay, great. Hmm. So we made a decision. I'll, I'll try to answer that. Um, we made a decision a while back. So let me, let me give you a little bit of background and I, I hope this doesn't go off on too much of a tangent. Um, Amy and I have older kids. They're out of the house. Um, we're not 20 something starting a new business, um, which isn't necessarily good or bad. It's just sort of where we are in life. Um, and um, I still have another career that I work um, as well as chocolate making. We did, we made a decision several years ago that we were gonna, we were gonna use Fresco and this business as maybe a retirement business, but just to enjoy and to have fun. So we weren't gonna go into any personal debt. We weren't going to try to grow it beyond what we could manage with just a few employees. And it's been fun. We have fun with it. And so if we wanted to do a crowd pleasing high volume bar and put it into grocery stores, that would be kind of a different model. And that's not where we are. We prefer to keep things, not necessarily small, small is not, not really the right word, but we prefer to keep things craft, artisan, personal. If I ever lose touch with being able to do an event like this, even though we're not in person, there's still only 35-ish of us here. And we can kind of have, we can have these dialogues one-on-one. -on -one. Um, if I ever get to the point where I can't do that, it's too big, then it's gotten too big. It's more than I'm interested in doing. And so what, I don't want to make a bar just to please the large volumes of people and sell it to a, a grocery store chain. We're in some grocery store chains, but it's not because we've made bars um, that are, you know, generic-ish. They're the same bars that Chocolopolis carried on their shelves. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but we're we're less interested in in a plain um, <clears throat> crowd pleaser bar and more interested in the unique character coming out of a particular origin and trying to exploit that with roasting and conching to see what we can pull out of the beans. Does that make sense? 
Valentina says exactly what we were wondering. So there you go. Okay, awesome. thanks. Let's move on um, to the San Martin Peru. Completely different region, completely different bean, different flavor. Um, you'll note, and go ahead and start whenever you're ready. You'll notice that there's only one light roast. I'll explain that here shortly. But start with that. Start with the light roast. Which you don't have, Lauren. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Thanks. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, we ran out. We ran out. Don't worry. It's a good problem to have. <laughs> your mom has it. Steal it from your mom. <laughs> okay, mom, save me one. Um, then go to the medium roast. Again, the same same pattern as the Nicaraguan. Start with the no conch and the medium conch. And then go to the dark roast. Now, it's important for at least for feedback for me, I'd appreciate it. Between the medium and the dark, get yourself a palate cleanser, drink some water, whatever, and sort of start fresh with the dark roast. I purposely did all potential ro all potential conch levels on the dark roast to see what the potential was. And I'm very interested in seeing what you think of that, all the way from no conch up to long conch. So let me back up and talk a little bit about the light roast. Of all of these, the, the, the Nicaraguan and the San Martin Peru, uh, I got the San Martin beans first. Um, and this was back in October when I started collecting uh, these two new origins. And uh, the first batch I did was a light roast. And quite honestly, I just, there was something about the light roast that just hit me like, yeah, I don't, I don't really want to continue on with this. I don't want to go further with this. I, I have a batch. I'm going to keep it and maybe use it someday for testing, which is what we're doing here today. Um, but I'm not necessarily sure I want to do anything with it long term. But it's there, and I'd like you to taste it. One of the poll questions is um, if you like it, sort of a one through five, I hate it, all the way up to I love it, and love to hear what you think of it. Uh, and then, uh, so that's why there's only one of those. Uh, then I went and did, went on to medium and dark roast. Um, as discussed. So let me go on to the next slide and I'll spend a little time talking about these just like the Nicaraguan and uh, then we'll go into the San Martin pole. Maybe you should tell them where you got that one. I do. Later. Oh, okay. Okay. These beans come from the Lamas, San Martin, Peru. Lamas is a city, San Martin is a state, as states go, as, as, as they're measured in Peru. Uh, and you can see on the, the map representation there where it's located in the country of Peru. Um, the Oro Verde Cooperative um, has almost 800 members. Um, they're all certified organic and fair trade. Um, and they do, um, this is a question we always get, so I, I try to make sure I understand where the beans are coming from and what they're used for. They do uh, get a higher price for these beans uh, and they promote the families, uh, specifically, it's on their mission statement, promoting the families and particularly the female women farmers who are um, <coughs> working in the farms. Here's a bit more about them. Um, Lamos San Martin Peru is the origin. Um, they've been around for about 20 years as a cooperative. Um, they are all organic and fair trade certified. There are 664 uh, farmers and 130 uh, female farmers. Um, these beans, I've had San Martin in the past, and they came from a, a, a different cooperative, and I, I had them, I brought them in through a very large broker. They were okay. Um, this was in the 2012, 13 to maybe 2015. Um, they, were, they were an okay origin. Um, they tasted pretty good, but there was, there wasn't the traceability that I like um, in cacao from this larger importer. And so that combined with an average cr uh, crop year um, around 2015, I decided, well, I'm gonna just drop the San Martin beans. This year, um, a friend of mine, uh, Paul, who runs a company very close to us here uh, where we live called Cool Chocolate, K-U-L, um, he imported uh, a container load, about 11 tons of the San Martin bean. Cool chocolate, I'll just plug them for a bit. They're, they have a different model than we do. Paul and I get along very well. We chat three or four times a week and, and 
our factories are close enough to each other where if I need to go winnow something on his bigger winnower or his bigger roaster, I, I just pop over and jump in and, and uh, kind of fit into his schedule and um, I help him out with some recipes. And so it's, it's a really great relationship. Um, they sell to um, grocery stores, um, larger accounts. So they're making 10,000 bars and, you know, selling them through distributors and that sort of thing, different models. So um, he's doing PCC's private label for the Seattle lights here. Yes, they yep, are. Yep, there. Absolutely. Anyway, but he brought these beans in. And uh, so I picked up some <clears throat> from him and um, decided I liked them. And uh, their, their mission has to do with helping women farmers around the world. And so that's really what they're all about at Cool Chocolate. And um, they've sort of scaled up to do that. So that's the backstory as to where these beans came from and, and um, what I'm doing with them. So here we are again with a similar slide. Uh, I described why we have just the, the light roast. So you'll taste that and see what you think. Um, on the medium roast, I started with no conch because when I was when I when I'm when I'm deciding which conch levels to try, I'll be tasting the chocolate along the way. And when I tasted this before I conched it, I, I kind of liked the flavor notes I was getting, some caramely notes. And I decided I'm gonna I'm gonna go with a no conch and see what happens. Um, you never really know as a chocolate maker right when it comes out of the machine what it's the flavor the end flavor is going to taste like because the flavor changes and settles over a several week period so you really have to pull the chocolate out uh, let it sit for a while to age a bit uh, at least three or four weeks mold it into tempered bars or, or sample beans in this case and then see what the flavor does for you and so there's, that's where we are today on this. So um, the no conch to me, at least ori originally was interesting. And then I added a few hours of heat and aeration to, to do a medium conch as well. And then I really wanted a representation of all the potential conch levels. Um, so that's what you're tasting in the dark conch levels. Um, something of, of each. And again, you may not taste such a difference between maybe a subtle or a medium. They may taste absolutely the same to you. Uh, and that's okay. I'd like to hear what you think of, of those different conch levels. Okay, so we're back to a poll. I'm going to start this poll. And let you take your time and uh, Ask questions, write your comments, uh, answer the poll questions as you as you can, and we'll spend the next few minutes just kind of uh, tasting and and talking. It's a weird question, Lauren, since you're the one seeing who's all here. Is Aaron from Intrigue on? Yep, he is. Hi, so, Aaron. Hey, Aaron. This just goes to show you guys that um, chocolate makers get along. I mean. <laughs> We really do. We love Aaron. Hopefully you love us too, Aaron. <laughs> Absolutely. There you I'm are. I'm inspired by how, how differently our, our brains work and the different ways we approach problems. You know, we've, um, uh, yeah, we do such different things. It, it, I, I do some, some chocolate making, but I don't uh, source and I don't roast and I don't crack and winnow. Being a very small and 125 year old building, they they frown upon us roasting in here. Something about historic fires and all. You might catch um, it on fire. <laughs> <laughs> but I I love I love your scientific approach to this, doing all the variables and, and picking stuff out. It's it's quite different from what I do, and I'm always inspired to to see and taste this. So thanks for for doing this, so we can participate in your process. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and we this also is, have somebody from Theon, too. Oh. This is Carl. I, I just wanted to add that um, that Fresco is like is the is the Washington knowledge resource for all of the sourcing and roasting and stuff. You're, you're the most knowledgeable in this area. So, yeah, where where we do different things, it's so wonderful to see other chocolatiers doing others. Yeah, kudos. Yeah, that's that's the fun part. Is you, you know somebody somebody even said that because um, about Paul at. Uh, um, cool was people were like, oh my gosh, are you are you scared that there's somebody that's 30 minutes away from you? And you know, we're like, 
no, because he's no, we're friends. We're friends. We're they don't realize him. I was just texting with him last night. It, you know, it's I, I think it's very rare that we meet somebody in the chocolate industry that doesn't want to talk to you. Uh, I mean, very, very rare. They're there, but it's super rare. So this is a great industry to be in. It is a very collaborative industry. It is. Yeah. Lauren, are we seeing any questions coming in? I see Not at the time. moment. Okay. Oh, wait, two new messages. Let's see. It's mostly, oh, Edward just says chocolate makes everyone happy, but it's mostly comments on people's um, tasting notes right oh, now. Good. Great. Thank you. And don't forget to vote, everybody. It looks like we have one person so far who's voted, which is fine. Take your time. You have a lot to taste. <laughs> And Rob, you commented that, um, or this, this, um, the San Martin is both organic certified and fair trade certified, correct? Yes. Yeah. I think I muted their super mic, but they had it in the other room. But. All right, polling is starting to come in. Feels like American Idol. Vote now for your favorite. <laughs> wow, pretty even distributed mm -hmm. so far. You guys will enjoy these results. I'm curious, it sounds like there are some people here who are making chocolate maybe as a hobby or starting to get into it. Um, I think I've seen some comments in the chat. Um, I think you can raise your hand or give us a comment. I'm just curious how many of you are, are trying this for either for fun or thinking about it um, for more. Lots of good comments um, and comparisons between the Opeo and the San Martin, which is good. Some of you like the Opeo more, that's fine. I like hearing that kind of feedback, just whatever your preferences are is good to hear. Did you want one to try? No. Um, Aaron's asking, um, do you ever get the chance to talk to the processor about adjusting their fermentation to fix things like high astringency? Because uh, we are getting a lot of comments Sorry, about astringency on this one. Astringency. Sorry, yeah. Lauren, you, you froze up for a second. I heard oh, you. Oh, I said, Aaron's asking, do you ever get the chance to talk to the processor about adjusting their fermentation to fix things like this? And we are getting a lot of comments about astringency on this bean, which I will chime in. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> for whatever it's worth. <laughs> yes, uh, sometimes um, they do take our feedback. Um, Strangency can be a problem in, in cacao. And sometimes it has to do with the bean itself. A lot of times it has to do with the fermentation levels. And so that's a good feedback. And um, I had asked the question about who's making chocolate for fun. Diane Stein um, says, as newbie chocolate makers, we're thrilled that we don't need to become expert roasters or sorcerers to be part of the community. And, and she appreciates learning from, from you guys. Um, Thank you. Yeah, just have fun. That's, that's the main thing for us is having fun with this. I have to tell you that, you know, 2020 made me actually grateful that Rob still had his day job. <laughs> I just, my heart just went out to all the people that, you know, this is their, that's their income, their sole source of income with, you know, fruition and I'm just trying to think of Markham and Fitz and those kinds of people that that's how they make their money and that's yeah. how they live and pay their mortgage. And, um, 
yeah, it was pretty scary. I'm curious if you guys have seen like what kind of supply chain disruptions on the bean front have you seen because of COVID? Well, yes. Yeah. So one example was uh, Marignan. the Marignan. We can't get those this year. <laughs> we were not able to get them into the U.S. because the government in Peru closed the closed some of the roads. Um, the, the port was closed for a while. And so the few beans that the Marignan company were able to ship actually went to Europe, um, went to Falkland, so they could continue on with their Fortunato line, which is the most um, well-known version of the Marignan product. Uh, but uh, so Marignan is gone from the, our yeah. from our line. The rest is just still sitting at the farmers. Yeah, um, a lot of it's delayed. So you know, beans that we could have gotten um, in, you know, you, you make a phone call or send them a note, and you could have beans sitting on your dock in three weeks. And that's now ten weeks or or longer, because warehouses are shut down or they have protocols and to where you know they're only at a certain percentage of capacity mm -hmm. for their workers and so everything sort of is affected yeah that's been some of the issues with the beans that we order from uncommon cacao it it takes us a usually it would only take us about a week and a half to two weeks to get the beans and now we're looking at four to five weeks and usually when you're ordering from Uncommon, aren't they coming from a warehouse on the East Coast potentially, but now maybe they're not, is that? They come from both. There, There's half a dozen major warehouses in the US that are FDA approved for beans. Um, there's one in New Jersey, there's one in Miami, there's Houston, there's East Bay Logistics um, in uh, Hayward, California in the Bay Area. Um, there's a small warehouse in Portland and one in Seattle, but from, from uncommon, they're either New Jersey or or the Bay Area. Um, and and um, Luis is asking about how the political situation in South America is impacting sourcing. I'm assuming like Venezuela. I was actually surprised when you said you've got some good Chihuahua beans because I haven't tasted anything that I've liked from Venezuela in a while. And most of what I've tasted has just been terrible. <laughs> I, but I haven't tasted much because I don't think anybody can get beans out of the country or if they are, they haven't been good. So. Maybe you could talk about that. Sure. So I'm most familiar with Chihuahua because it's the latest um, item or latest bean that I've been working with trying to get some. Uh, so there's a company called Franceschi that um, is the representative there. They're in Venezuela and they're also, they have an office in um, Oregon and Portland, uh, and, sorry, Bay Area. Uh, and those, that office, um, through that office, um, they're actually, they were able to get uh, a small shipment into the U.S. of Chihuahua beans, about four tons, uh, which is, sounds like a lot, but uh, for every chocolate maker that wants Chihuahua beans, that's, that's nothing. Any one maker would take those four tons and use them, you know, quickly. So um, just getting Chihuahua in the country is a problem. Uh, getting any Venezuelan has been very challenging. Um, usually you end up with one source, um, one importer. In this case, Franceschi is the name of the company that is responsible um, for the Chihuahua beans. This year they have the contract with Chihuahua. And so um, however they were able to do it, they got them out of Venezuela and into the U.S. at a, Chloe and Maria. Yeah, with, at, a uh, at a ridiculous price, but <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. <clears throat> um, Betsy wants to know if the fall hurricanes affected production. Yes, um, not not for us personally because the the beans that we needed from the places that were affected were already in the U.S. and we already had them sort of allocated for ourselves. But absolutely, um, Central America was devastated, and several regions had um, lots of damage. Um, I don't know that we'll see the effects of those on a larger chocolate maker, craft chocolate maker scale until Next year. maybe this, year, yeah, this as, year, as you know, the what was in stock in warehouses starts to get depleted and there's nothing new to replace it in some cases or limited stock um, to replace it. So you may start seeing shortages from many chocolate makers of certain origins um, in 2021, depending on how they, how much they had of their own stock. Hard to say, obviously. 
We're getting a lot of good comments in chat about comparisons of the two different um, origins and what people think. So I think you'll have a lot of good data to work with between your poll and, and the comments. Excellent. Looks like yeah. we're about 65% uh, of you have voted and we're getting close to our hour and a half time. Yep. So if you if you could just go ahead and finish up the voting, we'll give you another minute or two. So I want to make sure that uh, everybody has a chance to taste and to submit your comments and your poll answers so that your voice is heard. And Diane wants to know, are there other virtual gatherings? I think both Rob and we here at Chocolopolis do do a lot of virtual gatherings. So I think check out both of our websites. You guys are frescochocolate.com and we're at chocolopolis.com. And, and so we do have, both of us have, you know, we partner on this one, we partner on some, and then we both do others. We'll be adding more class, <clears throat> excuse me, more classes in the next couple of weeks. So right now everything looks like it's sold out because we don't have them scheduled for February or March yet. But it'll give you a, an idea of what we do offer. And I've got Valentine's Day uh, tasting classes on the 13th and the 14th ready to go. <laughs> but I haven't scheduled past that, so. Awesome. Can I, can I do one plug, Lauren? Oh, please, go right ahead. So we usually just focus on dark chocolate. Um, that's our thing. Um, we partner with a local candy shop to make some things um, that we don't make in our shop. Um, some confection type stuff, some, some brittles and some other things. Um, we can't, we worked with them. We came up with this killer recipe mm -hmm. for a Madagascar vanilla uh, marshmallows. And uh, we made them last year. They just sold out really quickly. We're doing a raspberry Madagascar vanilla chocolate covered marshmallow for um, Valentine's Day. So um, it'll be on our website within a within a couple of weeks. So if, uh, if that sounds interesting to you, if you're a confection <laughs> fan, keep a lookout for that. All right, we are at 90% voted. Give you another 30 seconds or so to um, put, any, put any notes or put it, do any voting. And then always, as always, keep the comments rolling in in the chat. That's very cool. There are lots of comments about this bean, which is awesome. Sour milk. <laughs> Sour milk was one of them. Yeah. Alice is asking about whether they'll be able to access this recording again. That's a really good question. Alice, we will have the recording. I think you can log back into Eventbrite and play it there, but let me get back to you on that in terms of, you know, if there's somewhere else we can also put it. I mean, I think we can put it on YouTube or whatever, but um, I'm not sure if we want to. I'll talk to Rob about that, but I think you can log into Eventbrite and it should be there on the online event page if you go to past events. Nice. All right, any last minute votes before we close the poll? Um, I'm not sure, Carolyn is asking, could you tell us about the blended Ghana medallions? I'm not sure. Oh, um, yeah, so we make we make these little, like great big chocolate chips, we call them medallions, and we use, use for baking or, you know, eating or whatever. Um, it's essentially, did we, we did all dark, didn't we? This last week, yeah, yeah. Like, but so, we've combined this so we call it blended, so it, it gives us license to mix things together if we want. But the the batch that we have on our website now is just all dark roast um, Ghana, our recipe 261, 68% 60, dark roast Ghana. And that's what the medallions are made of. So if you really like that recipe, um, it's well, it's less expensive to buy a pound of medallions than to buy a num several bars. Mm -hmm. So that's just, I hope that answers your question. And she's asked a follow-up question from Carolyn is why the blend of the two Ghana? Uh, we tr the first batch we did it was a blend of light and dark and it, it made a nice flavor profile. This one, um, we just, we honestly just used the dark roast Ghana, which is really lovely for baking. So. That. Chocolate maker's discretion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's on the shelf? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, honestly, so I'll give you a secret and probably shouldn't, but honestly, sometimes like, for example, drinking chocolate, that's a great one. We have a drinking chocolate blend and we could tell you it's a magical recipe of the 17 different chocolates that we make specifically for a drinking chocolate, but it's actually five pounds of this and eight pounds of that and whatever we happen to have left over that tastes good mixed together, we'll blend it, we'll try it, we'll blend it, we'll try it. And when we get enough put together to, you know, make enough to fill enough bags of drinking chocolate, we'll, we'll release it as our next blend of drinking chocolate. We don't do single origin drinking chocolates per se. A lot of people do, um, but we like blending stuff together. Honestly, when we come, when we get down to the end of our, of our tempering process and our tempering machine, there's always about three to five pounds of chocolate at the end that the, the depositing pump won't pump through the system. <laughs> So we get, we pull it out, we block, put it in a little block and we put it on the shelf and save it. And when we, we get enough of those, we grind it up and it's called drinking chocolate. Here's our secret. <laughs> <laughs> um, Luis is asking if you'll let us know what bars you choose to make with these two beans. And I'm thinking maybe when you, when you have an announcement ready, we could both um, announce it. That would be kind of fun. Yeah, absolutely. We will definitely do that. Okay, here are the poll results. Nod if you can see the results on your screen. Want to make sure you see them. Good. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, of the of the light roast. Well, that's interesting. Um, one is not good. Five is best. Nothing was best. I kind of figured that. It's got a got an off note to it. Um, two was. We can't see them. Oh. Oh, sorry. That's it. It's. Can other people see them? I can see, I can see them. Oh, so you may have, maybe see if you're on a different window and click on Zoom again, see if it comes back. Okay, so no surprise on the light roast. Not, not everyone's favorite. A few people tolerated it, so that's fine. Um, on the San Martin, on Martin, the San Martin medium, medium. Whoops, I'm getting some feedback. Mute your mics if you would. Uh, on the San Martin medium roast, um, the medium conch was preferred, but several people didn't like it, mm -hmm. which I would suspect there is some astringency there that's um, you all a lot of you noticed. Uh, the San Martin dark roast, while well, the medium conch was the favorite of those, and again, 10% didn't like any of them, which is good to know. And on the San Martin dark roast, where we had all four conches, um, the no conch was actually preferred. That surprises me a bit. The no conch tends to be a little. That was the least preferred. Oh, the oh, least preferred. Uh, look at which, your own question. Uh, <laughs> I guess I guess I should look at, look at my own question. Okay. Make it in there. <laughs> which one don't you not like? <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, least preferred. Gotcha. And then no preference. All right. So it sounds like from the from the um, from the chat sounds like between the two origins, the San Martin was the lesser of the two favorites. Um, some you didn't like it at all. And then the, um, the Opeo had some, some favorites and some, some less favorites as well. Um, any, if you would, um, send, a, send a chat message, just of, of all of them that you tasted. If you had one that you, you really liked, um, just put it in the put it in the chat, and if there and if you just really didn't like any of them, these are experiments, so I don't. It's not expected that you will like some and not like others. Um, there's no expectation at all. So whatever you whatever you get is fine. And Rob, there are a lot of really good tasting notes in the chat. I think you'll be really happy with um, what people have provided. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, so I had one last slide I'll send, I'll share with you um, as just kind of a small thank you for spending this time and helping us out with these recipes. If there's anything you do need from us, um, there's a code there for 30% off through the end of the month off our website. So uh, take advantage of that if there's anything we can help you with on the chocolate front. And as Lauren said, we will definitely um, We'll hook, Lauren and I will connect again when we when we decide what we're going to launch of all of this, and uh, you'll be the you'll be among the first to know. <laughs> so I'm going to stop sharing my screen because those are all of the slides that I have. And.
we're back to a view of everyone. Lauren, did you have any any of the anything in the comments that uh, we needed to answer? Any questions we didn't cover? I think we got through everything. I'm looking at people putting in their favorites, and Opio is like taking the the medal here. <laughs> we just got a San Martin vote, but um, but there's a lot of Opio. I mean, different treatments, but. Um, so yeah, just some really interesting comments. Does anybody have any other questions for, for Rob and Amy? Yeah, please. Any questions at all? It's fun to put spaces to names that I shipped out to. <laughs> yeah, really. All right. Well, um, uh, we'll stay here for a few minutes to make sure we're get, capturing all these wonderful comments for Rob and Amy. So this is just really valuable. We're, as Rob said, we've recorded this. So um, Rob and Amy will, are going to have a copy of all your comments um, as they develop the bars. And um, as I said, it should, this should be available on Eventbrite on the event page. So if you go to your past events, you're welcome to watch it again. And I will just confirm that so, um, so that you can see this again. Um, Aaron's asking, Rob, what kinds of chocolate do you prefer the most, strong, bold, or subtle nuanced? <laughs> oh, Aaron, uh, <laughs> the answer depends on my mood. <laughs> if I'm just going to sit and eat chocolate um, myself, I will often prefer something that is just sort of mellow and subtle, um, medium roast, kind of a kind of a longer conch, just something that's nice and blended. If I want something unique, I tend to gravitate towards the lighter roast. I just like that acidity. Um, I don't know that I have a favorite though, Erin. I uh, it depends depends on my mood. Who's your favorite chocolate child? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't have a favorite child. <laughs> um, we are getting a lot of questions now. So Edward wants to know when it comes to light, medium, and dark roasts, how much of that is higher temperature versus longer duration? Mm, good question. So for me, again, other chocolate makers may do it differently, but for me, um, it is mostly duration. Um, I may vary the temperature 10, 15 degrees, but I tend to roast sub 300 degrees for a longer period of time. I like a longer, um, more consistent roast. Uh, and so 250 to 300 degrees um, is in the range that I will roast. And I will just vary the time to adjust for light, medium or dark roast. Um, we've had a couple of questions about what's the best way to use up leftovers. And I think, um, and in baked goods, um, I, I, I mean, for me, it's often drinking chocolate, but I will tell you when, when I first opened Chocolopolis, my team and I would sit there and cut up chocolate samples for events we were doing. And so we'd have all these crumbs. And so we, we started keeping the crumbs. And one day we went, this is like crumbs from all these craft chocolates, all these different origins, everything else. And we went and made drinking chocolate and it was terrible because <laughs> we just put whatever in there. So uh, even though you combine them, it doesn't always work. But I know for us, drinking chocolate was often a good way or in baking. I don't know, Rob, Amy, how about you guys? What do you do with the ones you don't love? Uh, we have, so we're at our home right now and we have um, containers in our pantry of leftover chocolate bits, kind of like you did, Lauren, yeah. um, where you take, you know, you cut stuff up, you have crumbs, um, bits of things. Uh, these leftover beans that, uh, little bags of beans, those will go in the container at some point. And uh, we'll use them in cookies or ba brownies or you know, baking in general, yeah. I just don't let him co-mingle the 100% with my 70s and 80s. <laughs> and same with um, Madagascar. I, I'm an odd person. I don't like baking with Madagascar. I don't like that fruitiness in my, my brownies or, and I don't even like it in a drinking chocolate. So that stays away from all my other stuff in a separate bag. <laughs> you can see we don't um, agree. We have Diana's to asking, oh, sorry. No, we just have totally different palettes. That's a good thing, right? Yeah. Some for you, some for him. Um, yeah. Diana's asking for local Seattle shopping. What shops are you in? Um, you have us online, right, Lauren? No, I mean, I'm selling a bundle and I'm using it for classes, but I'm not selling individual bars okay. anymore. Uh, Chocolate Vitelli. Yeah, in Seattle. In Chocolate Seattle. Vitelli. And yeah. that's pretty much it. Okay. Yeah. Evelyn, oh, sorry. Evelyn wants to know, can you tell us more about the different ferments from Opio? 
Oh man. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> wow, that's a long question. Um, they, if you go, if you go to ingaman.com, the best way I can answer this is either just point you to their website or do another hour presentation. I'm going to point you to their <laughs> website. You go to ingerman.com and uh, look up their, their product profile sheet. It's like a PDF you can download. Um, and they have Opeo. They have a number of, or, number of different bean types. Opeo is one of them. Chuno is another. They, they have Opeo and then they'll have four or so different uh, fermentation profiles of Opeo. Um, if you actually geek out and get that into it, the beans that you're tasting are called Opeo Profundo. They have Opeo Classico, Opeo Profundo, and a couple of others. Uh, I like this fermentation the best. And um, so it's the Opeo Profundo that you're tasting. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of people writing this down. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> Geeky crowd. Everybody's going to go look at the website. They're going to get all these hits from their website. Yeah, they're going to go, why does, there, why does this increase? <laughs> you're you're going to go crazy if you're really into it because every one of them has a spider graph as to all the flavor profiles that you get out of the different uh, fermentations. And um, I, for folks like me, it's a lot of fun. Most people are like, whatever. Does it make good chocolate? <laughs> you know? But um, yeah, go look at ingerman.com and they'll You'll, you'll have all the information about fermentation you ever wanted. How many turns of uh, they do a day? I mean, everything down to long fermentation, short fermentation, drying times, it's all there. All right, well, we are on past 12.30. Uh, is there anything else, Rob or Amy, that you wanna share before we close out here? Just thank you, everyone. Thank you. This has been a lot of fun. Um, I think we'll probably make a habit of this with you, Lauren, and do it every so often, especially once yeah. we have something interesting to talk about. We will be having and we will be having another new origin soon. Um, Louisa, what link did you want us to put in chat? I'm not clear on what link you want. You can turn your microphone on if you can just answer me. Ingeman link? Oh, fermentation for Ingeman. Uh, Rob, do you have that website up? Mm. I can pull it up, don't worry. Okay. I'll put the link in chat. You want to show your conch? Yeah. Show we didn't get to the, the details on the conch. If somebody really wants to know about that, send me an email and um, I'll send you a, a link to some pictures. Okay, I just put the Ingham in. That's just the link to their website. You'll have to find the Opio Profundo and such on your own, but I'm sure you guys will figure that out. All right, so this is awesome. You can find Fresco at www.fresco.com or frescochocolate.com. And what are your what are your social media handles? Uh, Fresco Chocolate. Thank you. I, <laughs> you, 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 it's on both. You put them in, you put them in the, your link, and I don't always remember. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. And I'm, I, our, we're at chocolopolis.com, and I personally am at, at chiefchocolatefile.com. So I hope you guys will, if you're not already following us, stay tuned. We'll have more fun events. And as Rob said, we'll we'll collaborate on figuring out when to tell you about these, these uh, what, what he ends up choosing. Um, we're still getting a lot of comments. All right, so I think that's it. Thank you, guys. This has awesome. been really fabulous. Thank, Thank you, so Rob and Amy, for sharing this process with us. This was great. Um, oh, and somebody's asking if there'll be a follow-up email with links in the Fresco website discount. I can go ahead and send that to the attendees if you guys are okay with that, Rob. Okay. Yeah. yeah perfect. Thank, thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys. All right. Thanks, everyone. Good to see you. <clears throat>